Hi there and welcome to our lesson 7 I think we're on now on our final biology topic B6 beyond the microscope and we're going to be looking today at um, pollution and how water can affect um, how life lives in, in different bodies of water and how we can use what's in the water to help us uh, to decide whether it's polluted or not. Anyway, I'll see you at the end. Bye-bye. Okay, so our objectives for our lesson on life in water is by the end of this lesson you should understand the changes that can occur in different bodies of water. Living in water can have advantages and disadvantages. Some of the advantages include there's no heat dehydration worries as there will be no water shortages. There is less variation in temperature and organisms are supported which means that they can grow bigger with the same size skeletons and waste is easily disposed of. However, disadvantages include the water density will resist any movement and control of water going in and out of cells can be difficult. Now water pollution can come in a variety of different things. Seawater by sewage, oil and PCBs. Now PCBs are polychlorinated biphenols. Now PCBs are used in uh, manufacturing electrical equipment, heat exchangers and hydraulic systems. Now rivers and lakes or freshwater can be polluted by fertilizers, pesticides and detergents. Now within the water there are aquatic microorganisms. Now these can be affected by changes to pH due to acidic rain. Now eutrophication is something that we have looked at previously. Now it's caused by polluting bodies of water. Now what happens is nitrates are able to move into the body of water. Now what that does is it promotes the growth of plants. So you get loads of plants growing in that water. You also get a layer of algae forming on the top. Now not only are there plants in there but you've also got fish. Now because you've got this increased uh, algae growth on the surface it prevents any light from entering into the water so what will happen is these plants will end up dying now when the plants die what happens is they sink to the bottom now once they're at the bottom they then start to rot and decompose now when they start to do that what they then do is the oxygen that is in the water is then taken in by the bacteria which are decomposing aerobically. Now this then leaves the material at the bottom has decomposed completely. We've got no oxygen in the in the water which means we can get no more uh, plant growth so or animals because they cannot respire and they end up dying and this is what we call a uh, dead body of water. Uh, now the reason why we have all this dead material is because there is no respiration. Biological indicators are a more reliable way of looking for uh, polluted water. Now Biological organisms are sensitive to specific types of environment, so you might get an idea about whether uh, the water is polluted or has high oxygen levels or not by the type and number of different organisms within a particular area. So we can look at a couple of examples 
Now, mayfly larvae and stonefly larvae are very sensitive to changes in oxygen levels, so can only live where there is a high level or, of oxygen or what we call oxygenated water. Whereas, bloodworms and raptail maggots can survive in polluted areas where there is deoxygenated water. So what we can do is look for uh, numbers of these to say whether water is polluted or whether it is polluted to find high levels of the bloodworms and rat tail maggots. Now having a high biodiversity can give an indication <coughs> excuse me, to whether the water is polluted or not. High biodiversity would mean it's not polluted whereas a low biodiversity restricts the amount of organisms that you have so you're going to get more of the uh, organisms that are tolerant to pollution. Now if we have a look at this diagram here we can see that site C is polluted. Now it could be that at site A there are two factories or there are two communities where the pollution may be coming from. Now to decide whether it comes from A or B what you can do is look at the biological indicators at the two locations. Now we've got the results here and from these results you can see that site A has high numbers of mayfly larvae and stonefly larvae compared to site B. So the water at site B is going to have a high oxygen content therefore it's going to be less polluted. Now to confirm that if we look at the number of bloodworms and rat-tail maggots at site A, we've got virtually zero with just the one rat-tail maggot, whereas at site B, you've got a high number of bloodworms and a high number of, or a higher number of rat-tail maggots. Now that would tell us that the pollution at site C is coming from site B. Now living in water can be a problem for organisms such as the amoeba, which is a single-celled organism. Now what we can see in this diagram here is the water is moving into the cell. Now the reason it's moving in is because of osmosis, where water moves from a high concentration of water to a low concentration of water. Now because the amoeba has the lower concentration of water, the water moves in. Now the amoeba has no cell wall, uh, so it's not able to stay rigid and keep itself uh, structurally okay. Uh, so what it does is it moves all the water into this contractile vacuole. Now a contractile vacuole means that it can contract and get bigger with the water. Now what it will then do is it will then remove the water from the cell, making the cell less likely to burst. Now it moves the water into the vacuole by active transport, so it requires energy to actually move it in there. It won't happen via osmosis. And biomagnification is sometimes referred to as bioaccumulation. Now what this means is it means that toxins such as PCBs and DDT which is a powerful insecticide these can be consumed by plankton now when these plankton consume it it has no immediate effect on the plankton however as the chemicals move through the food chain they are not broken down now the small amounts that the plankton take on are not enough to do any harm to that or even the next few animals in the food chain. However, as we've seen in the previous topic, the plankton that consume the uh, toxins here, the PCBs and insect, the DDT insecticides, it moves up the food chain and it won't kill these organisms, but it could provide enough of the chemical to kill a killer whale. So recap, it's not enough to kill these organisms but is enough to kill that killer whale. Okay so let's have a quick review on what we have looked at. We have looked at eutrophication again and we've looked at how uh, fertilizers can cause that algal growth and then the plant material dies and aerobic respiration uh, of the bacteria can remove all the oxygen. 
we've looked at biological indicators and how they can give us an idea as to how polluted an area is by looking at the species and the number of species that are around and we've also looked at how amoebas uh, can survive in water and how we can get biomagnification or bioaccumulation within a food chain. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.